Thanks for joining us today. I'm Safia Kazi, and I'm the Privacy Professional Practices Principal at ISACA. I'm excited today to be joined by CEO of GBG Americas, Christina Luttrell, who's here to discuss her recently released article, Protecting Your Enterprise and Deterring Fraud in a New Risk Era. Christina, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Safia. I'm glad to be here. Now, before we get into the real meat of your article, can you just let us know a little bit about yourself? How did you get into your line of work? What does your education path look like? And what is it that you do now professionally? Sure, absolutely. So I've been in this line of work around identity and data for a little over 25 years now. I've uh, kind of started out with uh, in, in marketing, actually, and then quickly learned that I love technology and moved into a product management role at a previous company and uh, then just you know fell in love with product, building great product out of data and uh, then moved to my current my current company where I am today, which is GBG. I've been here for 15 years through some acquisitions of ideology, uh, started there and then uh, a GBG acquired ideology in, in 2019 and I stayed with the company and in 2020 became the CEO of, of, of GBG Americas um, here uh, located out of Atlanta, Georgia. So um, I, I probably took a little bit of a different path with education as uh, many, many folks do. I uh, actually uh, just recently completed my degree. I uh, worked for a lot of years um, without the ability to go to, to school when I was younger. So I just kind of worked my way into these roles and learned a lot, learned everything that I could from from the from the people that, that were around me and that I worked with. And, you know, I saw, I, you know, as a bucket list uh, a few years ago, I said, you know what, I want to go get my degree. You know, I, I don't really need it. I'm a, I'm a CEO at this point, but I would really like to have that hanging on my wall to say I've got a degree. So when when got my business degree and and uh, so I know it's not a normal path, but that's the the path that I took. That's super interesting because I feel like with a lot of these people I talk to who work in privacy or data, there's no particular one path that you have to take to get into it. There's so many avenues. So I think that's really cool. Um, but getting back to your article, your article is about fraud and how we're kind of seeing fraud ramp up a little bit recently. What was it that inspired you to write on this topic? Well, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this. I, I, I love to talk about uh, ways to, to help people reduce fraud, how to help consumers protect their identity. It's something that I've just um, been been very involved with and very passionate about for many years. And so, you know, I really wanted I, I really went into this article um, hoping to help businesses learn some some different ways to build trust. Uh, with their consumers, along with um, building an, an easy path to onboarding that instills trust with the consumers, but also building trust with consumers that are uh, choosing to transact with those businesses. Um, it, it is a delicate balancing act to reduce, to prevent fraud, but also create an easy onboarding experience for customers. And so, um, you know, it's it's a passion of mine to uh, to try to prevent fraud and to teach teach others how to prevent fraud. So that was really kind of my, my sole goal of uh, writing the article. Yeah, and in your article, you mentioned that just due to some circumstances in the last few years, fraud has been increasing. What are some of the factors that have caused this rise in the number of cases of fraud? I mean, really, the the the, the main crux of it all is, uh, you know, I don't want to talk talk constantly about the pandemic, but when we when we um, began in this pandemic two years ago in early 2020, um, a lot of people had never transacted online in a digital way, and so uh, we had people going online that just weren't used to um, doing online banking or signing up for P2P services, and so that acceleration of digital um, transacting really it, it 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 pushed more consumers online. But what it also did was it attracted more fraud, and so the the fraudsters would kind of look and see um, people that like vulnerable populations, right? So. Um, older senior citizens who may not have had a lot of experience transacting digital, digitally, and uh, the fraudsters uh, would start to target that population through phishing attacks, um, account takeover, things like that. So the pandemic, while it, and while it greatly accelerated the adoption of digital transactions, it also greatly accelerated 
fraud and the attempts that were in, in the cyber attacks that we saw coming through. Yeah, I know you frame that in the context of the pandemic, but I think a lot of the changes that happened during the pandemic aren't really going anywhere, you know, things like right. remote work, et cetera. Um, so how does this new era of risk give us a, an opportunity to tackle fraud with a lot more vigor than we might have previously? Yeah, I mean, I think it it, it opens up a lot of opportunity. First, we, we know a lot more now, right? So there's, a, there's more that the data can tell us. Um, we know, so, uh, you know, we can see so much more now about the devices that people are using and understanding how how um, devices are being used, how data is being used. And so it opens up the opportunity for businesses to also have more choice in how they want to transact with their consumers. So having some some um, variability in, um, for example, when they're onboarding a client, right? Um, do I want to, what what amount of uh, friction and pressure do I want to apply during this process that will give me assurance that I'm onboarding the, the right the right consumer to my service? And so um, it, it's it's opened up, I, I believe, a lot of opportunity. Um, fraud Fraud's never going to go anywhere. It's always going to be around. Uh, and so it, you just have to kind of stay in front of it, right? And, and, and see, um, and, and just kind of like, figure out what you need to do to combat that. And so staying one step ahead of that is always really important. And these tools that, that, that are out in the market that we're seeing things that, um, that the clients are using uh, are really, really uh, kind of groundbreaking type tools that are allowing people to stop this fraud coming through. Absolutely. And I think on the other side of fraud, we have things like trust and security and convenience for customers. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what some of the latest research is telling us about how important it is for organizations to prioritize things like trust and convenience when it comes to customers and the data that they might be handing over? Yeah, it is a little bit of a balancing act, right? It's um, in, in, in somewhat of a dichotomy that consumers, uh, they want an easy onboarding experience, or um, they want to be able to transact with you in an easy way, but they also expect companies to create a secure environment for them. So there, there is there are high expectations that um, that consumers are now placing on businesses to protect their data, understand how their data is being used, um, what you know, how you're storing my information as a consumer. Having that balance is really, really important to make sure that you're 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 stopping the fraud, right? And you're, you're but you're also protecting the consumer data, but also giving the consumer an easy process to sign up for your services. Um, building trust is really, really important. Uh, you know, one of the things that we always suggest when we're talking to clients or we're you know talking to others in the industry, other businesses is. It, be transparent with consumers. Help them really understand why you're asking for information. So if I go to your, if I go to a site to sign up, it's very important for me. I, you know, I want to treat. I, I'm a consumer. We're all consumers, and what I expect when I go to put my personal data into a website is I expect to know why do you need that information? Okay, is it for a re regulatory requirement like KYC? Okay, that's thumbs up, right? What are you going to do with this data? Right? How are you going to use it? What you know? What third-party suppliers are you going to send it to? And then further, once you have vetted my information, then what are you going to do with my data after that? Are you going to are you going to store it? And if you're going to store it, are you going to do that in a secure fashion, in an encrypted way? Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the data breaches that have occurred over the years, there's only a very small percentage of that data that was ever encrypted. The rest of it was just kind of like sitting around unencrypted, right? So for me, it's very important as a consumer to understand how are you protecting my data? And I think businesses that really get out in front of that as they begin the relationship with the consumer, those are businesses that are um, that are really succeeding and they're doing really well. An overwhelming amount of consumers um, told us in, in one of our pieces of research that we went out that we we conducted this year that um, knowing that a company is using strong security methods, strong identity verification, um, protecting data, knowing that is uh, that would 
that impacts their decision to do business with that company. So it's it, trust is so key. It's very important. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned that idea of balance. Um, and I think I've heard a lot of people say that within their organization, it's really hard because some departments just say, we need this data because it's going to give us insights. And I know you have a marketing background, so I'm curious to hear your perspective on that. You know, How can people who want to protect their customers and protect their data convey across their organization why it's so important to not collect too much data, to let go of it when it's time, et cetera? What, how do you think organizations can go about navigating that tricky balance. Yeah, I mean, less is definitely more. It's it's uh, you, you really don't want to hold on to super sensitive information. I think, you know, holding on having things um, in your in your CRM solution, right? Contact have, contactability, being able to contact your your consumer, your customer. Maybe that's a phone number or an email address, right? But is there really a, a reason to hold on to someone's social security number, right? Or their or, or their date of birth, unless you are an age restricted type um, type business. Um, even even address information. If you're not shipping anything to that address, um, then you know what's the purpose of holding on to it? So, I think you know taking a stance on keeping as l- the least amount of data as possible is, is really important. And you can still get a you can still get a lot of information from consumers. Um, you know, or, or, or let consumers opt in. What are they, what, you know, what, what do you, what do, the, what does the consumer want you to keep on them, right? What will they allow you to keep? Um, no matter what, what, no matter what you're keeping, what piece of information, please, please, please make sure it's stored safely and encrypted. But um, my, my personal stance is less is more. I, I don't think you need to keep a lot of sensitive data on consumers unless there's a regulatory reason to do so. Absolutely. And so what are some steps that organizations can take to gain back the trust of their consumers who might not necessarily trust that their organization is going to respect or protect their personal information? Yeah, the the first part of that is just uh, communication. So education, letting the letting the consumer know how how their data is being used. And and that can be through um, some text on the screen during a, a, a digital signup process. Uh, so letting consumers know how, you know, how, what you're going to do with their data, how you're using that data, and then collecting the least amount as possible, I think is really important and only, only holding on to what you need to hold on to. But I think um, what, what companies can do more than anything is just be transparent with the consumer so that they know what's happening. And, and, and it also gives the consumer a sense of control of, um, you know, that they're, they know their data is protected, but they also have some control over what's happening to their data as well. Yeah. And then shifting gears a little bit, what are some of the benefits of taking a customized approach to identity verification? Um, well, there's quite a few benefits, you know, um, and it's really going to depend in there. There are some things that you can kind of take apart here, right? So if you have a very, um, if you have a very high risk um, business, right, then maybe in that high risk section of, and maybe it's only a portion of your business, but in that high risk section of the business, perhaps you want to make sure that you're doing um, the highest amount of verification as possible, right? So it's a regulatory requirement because you're about to do some sort of financial transaction. So you might um, you might you might need to collect name, address, social, date of birth, um, and you know some other pieces of information. Um, but maybe another piece of your business or another p- portion of your signup process is just you know you just want to be able to contact someone. So you're just asking for their name and their email address. Um, having uh, systems that can be customizable or flexible that can flex based off of your use case and what you really need to c- can collect from the consumer is really important. But also taking that risk-based approach, let's say that um, you know I am signing up for a financial account and I have provided all of my personal data and something just looks a little off, right? Like there's just something that's not matching up properly or there's some sort of risk signal that's that's coming through. Only then would you want to maybe apply a little bit more friction where you might ask the consumer to present on the screen their their driver's license or take a selfie, something like that. Right. But if but if a consumer comes through and they're offering you their data and everything looks great, there's no risk signals or fraud alerts or anything that's happening, then you know, and it looks it looks like a really good identity. And that is um, the individual presenting that identity 
then what's the need to apply friction, right? So having that customization is really important for businesses because they can sort of branch from, um, you know, add more friction here, don't add friction, this is this is good to go. Yeah, so it seems like when it comes to how organizations are working, the threat landscape is just evolving so quickly. Um, and so now in relation to just remaining agile in light of this rapidly evolving threat landscapes, why is it that organizations need to think about assessing the risk that might be associated with a mobile platform specifically? Oh, wow. I mean, we, we uh, have seen just a, a huge amount of, uh, of, of mobile uh, cyber attacks and attempts coming through. In the, in the piece of key research that we conducted, there was, oh, I think we saw over 71% um, uh, with uh, smartphone cyber attacks in the past year, which was huge compared to the previous year. And, um, you know, they, we do everything on our mobile phones now. They go everywhere with us. And so um, I think that is the clearly the, 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 the next frontier. It's actually already here of where um, fraudsters and hackers are spending most of their effort and time. It's, uh, you know, smish, smishing. It's kind of a hard word to say. SMS phishing. Um, links that can be clicked that can take your information. Um, uh, you know, malicious apps. There, there's so much that can happen on a device, and I think we have to be really, really cognizant of that and really aware of what we're doing with our phones, what we're allowing to go on to our phones as well. It looks like a common theme here is transparency. Um, I know just in the last week, Google was fined $391 million as a result of a lack of transparency. So why will higher levels of transparency be required when it comes to data collection policies and justifications moving forward? So I think, um, you know, we have things here in the U.S. I know you're, you're a global platform, a, a global platform, but here in the U.S. we have things like um, CCPA, which will then become CPRA. Um, those things uh, are, you know, and there's similar uh, red, leg legislations that are rolling out across other states or proposed across other states um, and giving consumers the ability to have more control over their data. So, I think it's just going to be much easier for companies to be to, to have that level of transparency to say this is how we're using your data because consumers are gaining control of that and rightly so we should have control of our data and how it's used and um, so that you know as as more regulations roll out and more more legislation is proposed I think um, we're only going to see more of this come through where it's going to be a requirement that you have to tell customers how you're using their data and, and you know, how customers can get their data out of your list. Yeah. And so going back to this idea of identity verification, what is its role when it comes to offering trust, especially in the uncertain times that we're living in now? Um, well, I think having a really good, uh, having a good identity verification solution uh, can can make or break uh, a, an onboarding experience for a consumer, and uh, you know the, the the consumers that we surveyed as part of our consumer digital study, seventy six percent of those that we surveyed said that knowing that a business uses a, a really strong identity verification solution influences whether or it influences their decision to do business with that company. So. Um, understanding that you know there, that it's it's being used in a, in a responsible and reasonable way, and that they're 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 going to be protected, and this is doing their this verification is happening to protect them, and the data is being used uh, properly. Those are things that consumers say influence their their decision to transact with another business online. So it's it's really important. It's important. It's an important piece of the onboarding process. Yeah, and can we talk a little bit about identity verification in the context of minors? You know, there's so many privacy laws and regulations that say, if you're processing the data of somebody under this age, here are the special considerations you need. And there's really not much that stops a 10-year-old from joining a website and claiming they were born in 1990. So what's the role of identity verification when it comes to processing the data of minors and ensuring that that data is treated the way it needs to be treated based on laws and regulations? 
Right, right. So, so our company um, at the ideology company, we we um, we uh, conform to the COPPA regulation and have for many many years. So, you know, that data completely just isn't even collected if once we once we get a transaction to process and realize that the, that it is a minor, someone under the age, um, uh, as far as the COPPA regulation goes. Um, I think that many of our clients, you're right. I mean, any 10 year old can sign up for a website. It's really important that you have some, some safeguards in place to, to prevent that. And if you see, if you, um, can tell by the data that that is a minor that's coming in, it's really important that you just completely, you know, wipe that from your system and don't collect that at all. Uh, so I would just recommend, um, at least here in the U S that, um, businesses make sure that they're up to up to date on copper record copper regulations and what that what those requirements mean and, and how to comply with those requirements as a business we do but i think it's really important that um you know that other businesses financial institutions they they also make sure they're complying as well all right now i'm totally shifting gears here getting very lighthearted. um but so Obviously, you're the CEO of GBG Americas, you're an author, but you've also won several awards from Security Magazine, Atlanta Business Chronicle, Global InfoSec Awards. And in addition to that, you manage a 40-acre farm. How do you do it all? Do you have any time management tips for our listeners, for people who really want to be able to have that career success, but also have you know plenty of time to do the things that fulfill them? Yeah, I, I, I get up really early and I go to bed really late. Now, um, yeah, so, I, you know, for me, um, I, I think prioritizing is really important and prioritizing things that matter. Um, but the, the biggest thing is that I really I'm really picky about what I give my time to. You know, if you think about just trying not to get too philosophical here, but time is our greatest currency. Right. And in. Um, it's really important that we give to give our time. Think about all the things that you give your time to throughout the day, right? It's really important that we give our time to things that really, really matter. So for me, you know, I, I love I love what I do. I'm very passionate about what I do, and um, I'm very I, I feel very blessed to be able to get up in the day and and do the things that we do here to help protect consumers. Um, but you know, there's at the end of the day, I also just kind of I kind of log off for a little bit and go spend time with my animals, right? I like to, I like to just kind of decompress and be around, be around my livestock just to, just to kind of have a different uh, change of scenery. I think it's just, you know, focus on the things that matter and what, and, and where you're really spending your time. Um, we're only given so many hours a day, so many, so many days in our lives. And that's, that's really important to make sure you're, you're spending that, 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 um, that currency on, on things that are worth it. Yeah, I love the way that you think about time in that way. Um, now, before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to share with your listeners that you didn't have a chance to discuss yet? No, I just appreciate appreciate you having me on today. It's been really nice to talk with you. You too. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that's all we have time for in this episode. But if you're interested in reading Christina's full article, Protecting Your Enterprise and Deterring Fraud in a New Risk Era, please click the link in our episode description box. That's it for this episode. I'm Safia Kazi, and thank you for tuning in.